I am not a historian, but neither are you. So, how about we, the people, learn this stuff together? Welcome to US 101. And if at any point in time during this episode you you, you have an urge to, to just pause the episode and get up and, and run to your cupboard, I completely understand. And let's think about this for a second. During this time of the coronavirus and, and being in quarantine, how often do you go to your fridge or your pantry or your cupboard after you've already finished eating, open it up and just look? Just to see if, I don't know, something new has magically appeared in that space. The fact is, a lot of us now, because we're in quarantine, because of this virus, we're eating a lot more because since we're at home, we are way closer to our kitchen than we are when we're at work or school or out. And what are people eating? Besides, of course, you know, the main meals of the day. Breakfast, lunch, second lunch and dinner. Snacks, ice cream, cookies, candy, peanuts, pretzels, popcorn, and of course, cereal. I, I love cereal. And not just for breakfast, but something I can just pour into a bowl and, and munch on when I'm doing other things. It, it, is, it is the perfect snack, y'all. It's bite-sized, it comes in numerous shapes, numerous flavors, it goes good with or without milk, and it's pretty inexpensive. So when I went to the store earlier this week and picked up my uh, my most recent box of, of Honey Nut Cheerios, I started thinking to myself, when, how and when did this food become so popular? When did cereal become a thing in, in the United States? Who created cereal? Why did they create cereal? And naturally, because I have a show like this, I decided to do a little research and, uh, and make a US 101 episode out of it. Besides, I already did it with donuts and that seemed to go pretty well, so... Uh, this seemed to be the uh, the next logical step. So to tell you this oh so delicious tale, I have to take you back briefly uh, to the 18th century. During colonial times, uh, breakfast wasn't really considered like a meal yet. If colonial Americans woke up after a, a night of slumber and they wanted something to eat in the morning, they either just like had leftovers from the night before, or they would make a bowl of porridge. That's that's what porridge looks like. It's not doesn't look all that. All that appealing. On top of that, if they did eat in the morning, it, it probably happened after uh, they were out already working. Like, they worked in the morning first, and then they would sit down to a meal after, you know, tiring themselves out a little bit. But as America became a nation, and then started to become a larger nation, and a more wealthier nation, like we do, because we are Americans, we <laughs> decided to indulge ourselves a little bit on the breakfast front. Americans start eating a lot like how the Europeans do, which was to have a big spread in the morning with things like eggs and ham and sausage, like a, like a legit full meal. And this trend of eating a hearty breakfast continues into the 19th century, especially in places like the Midwest and rural areas where you have uh, farmers and you have laborers. These are people whose professions required them to eat a lot of food before they went off to work because they had a full day of work ahead of them, so they figured, let me fill up now, that way I have the energy uh, to sustain me throughout the day. So these people are creating these like amazing breakfast spreads in the morning with tons of meat, tons of carbs, oats, wheat, just stuff that's gonna fill them up and, and, and punch them with a lot of protein. But the problem with regularly consuming these meat-heavy meals that early in the morning uh, is twofold. First, and most importantly, uh, it becomes a health hazard to eat this way on a regular basis because when all you're doing in the morning is just slamming like different types of meats and different types of carbs and no real fruits or vegetables to sort of break it up, Americans start suffering from a lot of indigestion because when you only eat that kind of food, your body after a while is like, slow down, it's taking me a while to actually like process all the stuff that you're trying to eat. And secondly, as America becomes more of an industrial nation and less of an agrarian nation, uh, time becomes a factor in preparing your breakfast in the morning. As more Americans are moving into the cities and starting to work in factories and shops and stores, places that you now have to work according to a schedule. You're on a regiment that you have to be here and punch the clock at a specific eight o'clock, seven o'clock, six o'clock in the morning. And if you don't show up, someone else is gonna step in and take your place, which means there's not a lot of time to prepare that big and hearty breakfast. So as as more Americans are going into the workforce, into these more regimented, scheduled workplaces, uh, there's a growing need for a food that will fill you up in the morning, will give you a bit of nutrient, and will also count as that breakfast gets you out the door and gets you going on your day. Which brings us to a physician, a nutritionist, an inventor, and a missionary that would change the breakfast game 
forever. This person also believed that a vegetarian diet, avoiding alcohol, tobacco, and caffeine, and pooping four to five times a day, similar to the gorillas that he studied uh, in a zoo, was the key to a long and healthy life. And to do this, this person believed that food should be consumed not just to purify the physical body, but the spiritual aspect as well. In fact, this man emphasized that clean eating, a healthy diet, eating the right foods would also quell one's urges to, um, Oh, how can I gingerly put this? Uh, to, to become intimate with oneself. And this man would go on to invent that food that would encourage regular bowel movements and uh, uh, less hands in the pants. That man's name, John Harvey Kellogg. And if that last name sounds a bit familiar to you guys, it should, because if you look at literally any box of cornflakes, the name Kellogg is right there at the top. Before inventing cereal and becoming known as the father of modern uh, breakfast cereal, in 1876, to help out his patients achieve physical and spiritual purity, he opened up a sanitarium in Battle Creek, Michigan. Now, when you hear the word sanitarium, or if you listen to the Metallica song, sanitarium, you're probably thinking like insane asylum where they put people that are mentally deranged and, and insane. No, his sanitarium would be the equivalent to basically like, like a health spa. So if you went to Kellogg's Battle Creek Sanitarium, you'd get like medical treatments, you'd get like pampered, you'd get massages, and then you'd also get food that would encourage you to eat healthier and eat cleaner. And one food in particular would be first introduced to Kellogg's patients in 1877. Kellogg's food concoction consisted of twice baked mixed flour, oats, and cornmeal. And then he would bake those grains at a high temperature believing that the heat would cause the grains to be more digestible, thus more healthier. Now, I should point out that before Kellogg started creating his first version of cereal, in 1863, a man by the name of James Caleb Jackson, also a vegetarian, somebody that promotes vegetarian diets, and he also has a sanitarium, creates his version of cereal called Granula. But the reason that we know the name Kellogg when it comes to cereal in the United States and not James Caleb Jackson is because of what happened to Kellogg's cereal recipe in 1898. According to the Kellogg's company website, it is said that the Kellogg's were making a batch of their cereal and they left the dough out overnight longer than they normally would. And leaving the dough out for a lot longer than they normally should caused the dough to ferment. So when they came back and they rolled the dough out into these thin sheets and they throw it in the oven and they bake it at this very high temperature, the dough came out a lot flakier, it came out a lot crisper, came out a lot crunchier. And when they served this crispier, flakier cereal to the people that were staying at Kellogg's Sanitarium, or the San, as they called it, they Loved it! Couldn't get enough of these flakes. Yet while John Harvey Kellogg is seen as responsible for creating cereal, it's his brother Will that tinkers with the recipe a bit more and makes it a bit more familiar to what we know today. Will Kellogg takes these flakes to the next level by first buying the rights to the recipe from his family and then in 1906 opening up his brand new company called the Battle Creek Toasted Corn Flakes Company. Why corn flake? Well, because Will, in the interim between buying the recipe and then John creating the cereal, he kept tinkering with the recipe and he realized that if you substitute wheat with corn, it makes the flakes crispier, crunchier, just more fun to eat because, you know, it's got a crispy sound to it. Oh, ooh, ooh, that's, that's just a joy. And then after Will Kellogg attained the rights to the recipe, he continues to tinker with it even more, now adding sugar, malt, and salt to the dough, thus making it a sweeter treat. And by 1909, Will Kellogg's Corn Flakes, his company, is churning out 120,000 cases of Corn Flakes a day. So now cereal in the United States starts to become the hot new trend. And what happens when there's a hot new trend? People want in on it. Competition starts to grow. And one of those competitors happened to be a man that actually stayed at Kellogg's Battle Creek Sanitarium for a time. His name is C.W. Post. Post, what he would do is he would take Kellogg's recipe and adapt it a little bit, and he gave his cereal a new name. It's a name you've seen on cereal shelves to this day, Grape Nuts. Now remember, still, it's early days in the cereal game, which means cereal is still being uh, promoted as this healthy breakfast option, right? So Post goes on the offensive and starts marketing Grape Nuts as the cure for, like, all ailments. Everything from malaria to rickets, it'll cure your alcoholism. Post would even go on to declare that eating just one pound of Grape Nuts, one, was equal to the nourishment that you would receive after eating 10 pounds of meat, wheat, oats, and bread, which, by the way, 
Who in God's name is eating 10 pounds of meat, wheat, oats, and bread? That's a death sentence. And as the 20th century rolls on, more and more cereals start to flood the market. For example, in the 1920s, a health nutritionist accidentally spills some wheat bran on top of a stove. It heats up. It becomes these crispy flakes. And he has invented Wheaties. In the 1930s, three cartoonish characters by the name of Snap, Crackle, and Pop introduced Rice Krispies to the American public. And then in the 1940s, Cheerios show up on the scene, but they're called Cheery Oats first. Tony the Tiger comes along to tell you how great Frosted Flakes are in the 1950s, the Trix Rabbit shows up in the 1950s, and Sonny the Cuckoo Bird goes cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs in the 1960s. In the 1970s, Captain Crunch shows up, then you've got Count Chocula, Boo Berries. By the 1980s, you've got celebrities starting to uh, license their imaging to cereals, but you're starting to notice now that cereals, as time has gone on the United States, start to back away from like the health aspect from eating cereals and start to focus more on reaching a specific demographic of American. A lot of times it's kids and you want to reach children from a marketing aspect because as we all know, when a child sees something that it really wants and the parent does not want to get it for them right away, it will ceaselessly nag that parent until it gets its way. And this also ties into how marketing plays into the success of breakfast cereals and how uh, the creation of brand loyalty comes into play when choosing your favorite cereal. But that, that's for an entirely other episode. To talk about marketing and economics and stuff, that, that deserves an episode on its own. There you have it, guys. The American history of cereal. A food that started by a man who only wanted people to poop four to five times a day and to not touch themselves. It's come a long way since then. So now I ask you, residents of the United States, nay, residents of the world, what is your favorite cereal? When it comes to brand loyalty and you're in the cereal aisle, what do you go to first? Me? I'm a Honey Nut Cheerios guy. And I do believe, if I'm not mistaken, Honey Nut Cheerios is the best-selling cereal ever. So if you're gonna go with anybody, for me, you go with the goat. But how about you? Are you a Wheaties person, Lucky Charms, Cocoa Puffs, Captain Crunch, Kix, uh, Grape Nuts, Corn Flakes, Special K? Uh, are you into specialty cereals? And you know, when a movie comes out, they tie a cereal together with it. For a while, I was into the, the, the Superman cereal when Batman v Superman was coming out. It was quite tasty, actually. But what cereal are you a fan of? Let me know in the comment section down below. Honey Nut people, unite. But thank you so much for watching, guys. As always, you can follow me on Twitter, on Facebook, on on Instagram, all the links down below in the description box. If you just want to chat and say hi, I am an ear that you can always bend. Guys, I will see you next week for an all new episode of US 101. Until then, I am all done. I am actually uh, going to let the screen fade out. I'm not even going to walk off screen like I normally do. I'm just going to sit here. I'm going to pour myself a bowl of honey nut. Got to get that honey nut in your belly. You, got, you guys can go. I'm just going to eat these right home. Oh, it's delicious, man.